Right, okay. Hello, lovely to see everyone at the Ilka Expert Talk Series. Okay, just letting everyone in here. And... Please do share your location where you're logging in from today in the chat. That's our ritual for the beginning of these. We love to see that. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. There's always a tech issue, as we know. <laughs> always something happening. Okay. Elborg joining. Okay, lovely. And we'd love to hear where you're joining us from, so do throw it into the chat so that we can see hmm. a variety of locations. Canada, excellent. All right. Okay. Argentina, Poland, lovely. Okay. So we've got <laughs> wide variety. A London bus. Hello, Nicola. Hello. Lovely to see you from a London <laughs> bus. Okay. We haven't had that one yet. <laughs> okay. Love it's it. Paris, wonderful. Okay. Lovely. Lovely. UK, excellent. <laughs> Oh, well, Nicola's actually on the bus. <laughs> That's awesome. We can see the bus, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. That's All right. right. Okay. Talk about resilience, flexibility, agile. <laughs> I don't know. You name it. You okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So lovely to see everyone here today. And uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Maria Ortega Garcia. And she'll be talking about a paradigm shift, which as we can see, a lot of you are interested in. Uh, it's the human factor in coaching. And I think it's not really only about coaching, is it? So it's about the way that we we build and uh, uh, relationships and engage with other people and how it transforms us. And it's a bi-directional thing. Uh, at least that's what I got kind of from the introduction. Um, about the speaker, Maria, would you like to say a few words about yourself? I think it's much more credible if you say, few words and if I just kind of re read out the text okay so welcome thank you very much for being here thank you well um yeah well thank you for having me and um I am um a language coach so I'm an educator I'm a writer and I'm a poetry therapy practitioner so I've been running my language coaching business since since 2011 and I have training in coaching, in uh, poetry therapy, and um, in trauma-informed education. And I have also received informal training in all these areas in neuroeducation, psychology, eco-psychology, um, embodiment, authentic relating, etc. And I am a mentor for language teachers. So that's uh, who I am. And yeah, I think that's that covers everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, about Ilka, before we jump into it, uh, we established, founded Ilka in 2019, and we've been going strong since then. And uh, one of our missions is to share all the information, all the knowledge, and all the skills that we can. Um, to everyone who is interested in learning and understanding language coaching as Ilka understands language coaching. And uh, we're very happy to have this monthly talk going strong for four years now, which I think is really good. And it's uh, it's proof of the interest in language coaching as a discipline and uh, also in Ilka. So we're very proud of ourselves with Carrie. Carrie, do you want to say anything? <laughs> add to that <laughs> um well i it it feels wonderful to hear you say we've been doing this for four years this monthly talk and to kind of take that moment and and celebrate that um i do want to say that we hope to see all of you this year in budapest uh, i don't know if i'm stealing your thunder gabriella but <laughs> all fine we, we've got dates we've got a city we're having our yearly conference um in the beginning of june in hungary so the conference page is now live on our website you can go there and learn all about the themes this year you can apply to be a speaker there um all, all of the things we're very excited to to be organizing the third annual ilka conference um and to be organizing this early i think we're, we're getting better and better <laughs> Well, <laughs> earlier and earlier, so that's <laughs> yeah. 
and better and better. Um, and so, so yes, please come to the conference. We hope to see you there in person. And also for this talk, uh, if there's anything in it that you want to see again at the end, something like that, um, it, we post all of these on our YouTube channel and all of those previous talks that we've done are there as well. So please do go and subscribe and watch there. We appreciate every single subscription. We've painstakingly built a small following on YouTube. And um, yeah, please go there to, to see it after and to see some of the other talks that have come before this. And yep. that's, a, oh wait, well, and a field program cohort will be starting again in, when are we starting again? November. November. So, Indeed, yeah. yeah. So please take a look at that as well on our website, ilkaglobal.com. And I am going to be quiet now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Over to you, Maria. Thank you. We've done all our housekeeping. Okay. If you've got any questions, stay muted, throw all your questions into the chat box, and then we'll come back to it. There will be a very extensive um, Q&A opportunity afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll be muting myself. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so the title of this of this talk um, centers around the paradigm shift that needs to occur when we move from being a teacher to being a coach. And um, teaching, I think, has been traditionally understood as we know as imparting knowledge. So, as language teachers, uh, it focuses on the language. Whereas coaching focusing, focuses more on the individual and how to help them acquire that language knowledge. But all these, for me, um, these definitions miss the point a little bit um, because it turns the spotlight outside, either on the language or on the learner. And yes, of course, um, both parts um, are, are essential in this equation. But the third element on this equation is us, the teacher or coach. And here I do not make a huge di distinction between teaching and coaching. Um, so I see that we um, as humans um, are expanding our consciousness and are becoming more aware of how our history, our past trauma um, impact our present behavior. And I have, really never agreed very much on the idea that in the idea of separating our professional persona and business from our personal self, our personal persona in a way, because I believe that our upbringing, our culture, um, our conditioning and past experiences and sometimes um, traumas are not only impacting our personal lives, our personal sphere, those things are also impacting um, our professional lives and with it, the perception of the object of our work, in this case, languages, and also our relationships with our clients or the learner. So um, I think that, well, I believe that I must turn the spotlight on me or we should turn the spotlight on ourselves as the individual in um, the moment I choose to, to work in a career that involves relationships. And this is the key element. Um, being a coach, we have a relationship with our clients and that's, that's, that's essential, right? Um, because What I know about who I am and what I believe in impacts those relationships with my clients. But also, what I don't yet know about myself impacts those relationships, and often negatively. So it is my responsibility, in a way, to be aware as much as I can of what I am bringing to the, to the relationship and understand how I may be harming the people or clients I initiate a professional relationship with um, by not being aware of, of some things. And, and here I'm going to, to evolve a little bit more. But um, in the book Relational Coaching by Eric Dehan, he mentions 
that the quality of the relationship be between the professional or coach and the client appears to be closely related to the success of the coaching or training. And this is not a surprise, right? Um, but the quality of the relationship is not about how friendly the relationship is or how professional, quote unquote, the relationship is. And, and here, I understand that, pro I believe that probably the word professional means different uh, things for different people. But the quality of the relationship means um, how compassionate and empathetic the professional is how safe it is for both um, the coach and the client to express themselves, to express their identity, their emotions, etc. This is um, the talks of, this talks about the quality of the relationship. And I am purposefully including the term emotion in this list because emotions are part of the relationship. And so how we welcome them and embrace them, safely for both parts um, is an essential part of the quality of the relationship. So let me tell you a personal story. A few years ago, um, I had a client who started the first session together after, you know, having the, the previous conversation uh, days before to get to know each other and, and decide if we wanted to work together. So he started the conversation uh, with unprompted misogynistic and xenophobic comments. And as a woman myself and a foreigner on the country I call home, I initially felt a little bit attacked. <laughs> I felt anger. I felt anger. I could feel my blood boiling and I was, honestly, I was shocked. I couldn't understand how the conversation had taken that turn in the first 10 minutes of the session. Just couldn't make, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And in the past, I would probably had, I would have said something from a place of anger or I would have reacted to those comments. Basically, I would have taken the bait. But this time, I felt my anger. I was aware of it and I decided to distance myself from the situation and his comments, knowing that he's only talking, he was only talking about himself, had nothing to do with me. And um, I chose to be curious about those comments and become a mirror for him. That is, none of his words were coming through to me. I was bringing them back with curiosity. What happened after a few minutes is that he, again, unprompted, apologized for those comments and proceeded to explain that he was having problems with his business and, and his marriage, and he was very anxious and extremely worried. Um, and in a way, he wanted to you know, control a part of, of his life or some, uh, felt that he could control some part of his life by, by behaving like this. So, of course, I accepted the uh, the apology and understood his behavior. So it was quite easy for me at that moment to feel compassion and empathy and bring that into the relationship moving forwards. And after that, the relationship went, was respectful and open and good and we continued working together for months. So why I am talking about this example, this situation is because that only happened, that interaction working in that way or evolving in that way only happened once I went through the personal journey of understanding my triggers my and, and my behavior when triggered and when I learned how to read my emotions and work with them instead of what I used to do and what I think is quite common either crush them <laughs> and then feel in a certain sense of betrayal towards myself and eventually detachment towards the relationship or ignore them, pretending that they are not there, that they don't exist, but reacting from a place of an unacknowledged emotion. And so detachment from a relationship often leads to not caring for the other person and reacting from an unacknowledged emotion 
often leads to harm. This is not a safe environment and the quality of the relationship would be poor, right? So how do we foster a safe, high quality relationship? And in my understanding, there are three points, three elements. One is self-awareness. The other is embracing emotions. And the last one is empathy and curiosity. So self-awareness involves, as we know, being aware of different aspects of the self, including identity, traits, behaviors, and feelings. Essentially, it's a psychological state in which oneself becomes the focus of attention. So self-awareness is one of the first components of the self concept to emerge. And what is self-concept? Um, self-concept is how we perceive our behaviors, abilities, and unique characteristics. For example, beliefs such, beliefs such as I am a good listener or I am, a good, uh, I am good at languages are part of an overall self-concept. Our self-perception is important because it affects our motivations, our attitudes, and behaviors. So the first question we need to understand to, to ask ourselves is who am I? This is a question about identity. Um, and to talk about identity is to talk about the self and the self-concept, the knowledge, beliefs, memories, expectations, tendencies, and understandings that everyone has that define them as a unique individual and also as members of a family, as a group, um, community, etc. So identity shapes how we interpret our reality, the past, present, and future. It informs what we think we deserve or how we should behave and provides a measure of our worth. And yes, of course, identity and personality can be reshaped and are not fixed, they are fluid. We are always changing, but at the same time, they are there are constants. Uh, for example, identities we attach to or facets of ourselves we identify strongly during our life or periods of our life. And what is more important, there are traits that makes us who we are and the way we are at a specific point in time. So why is it important to recognize our identities? Because we are who we are at the moment we initiate a relationship with a learner and that will impact and shape that relationship. This is the starting point we need to explore deeply. Explore who we are first and then explore who our learner is or our perception of them. From there, we will start a conscious relationship based on awareness. These elements will shape the relationship and the relationship will shape us in return. But we need to know our starting point. The second element in this um, is the emotions. As I said, emotions are super important for the learning process. We all know that without emotion, there is no learning, but also um, emotions are important because they are always there. We are always feeling something. In a way, emotions are signposts of how we are in a moment. And they carry essential information for the relationship. So there are a few questions I keep asking myself every time I engage with a new client and before I jump on any client call. These questions are, how am I feeling right now? How am I feeling towards the client or the subject we are going to breach today? And the thing is that in my sessions, the language is often secondary. I believe when we are coaching, um, we tend to work more about all the things <laughs> that are around the language, all the issues um, around the language. In my case, the nature of my work, I, I work around the language expression 
the issues that go around uh, the language expression, like lack of confident expression, um, lack of authentic expression. We often talk about you know, um, not being authentic. Um, I work with feelings of inadequacy, disconnection, or isolation. So those topics are things that I believe we all experienced sometimes or often. And so as, a, as an individual, as a person who has experienced things as anyone else, um, it is important for me to check in with myself and understand that if I have to work with a client who feels disconnected from their community, and for example, they blame their own incompetence with the language, or they blame the people in their community, or they blame themselves, I need to understand how I feel about those things myself, because I probably have gone through through those experiences in the past or I am going through them so how I am I, how am I feeling about those things about those issues um and whether those issues issues has have been whether they have been resolved within myself or not I still need to understand what emotion I am bringing to the session in connection with these topics so that I can cause as little harm and I have as much of a positive impact as I can from what I am aware of. So my job, my responsibility when I start a, a session is being as, as aware <laughs> as I can of all the little elements that have an impact to the, in the session. So for me, this is just embracing the emotion and extracting all the information that emotion brings. The second part of the equation here, when talking about emotions, is the, the emotion that the, ener the, the client brings. So I need to understand how they feel about having coaching around this topic. I need to understand what emotion they bring uh, to the session around the topic we are working with. And the common, common emotions that I have seen clients bring in to the relationship are anger, frustration, shame, guilt, and these emotions can be quite harmful. <laughs> they are quite charged. So as language coaches, we need to be able to deal safely with those emotions that our clients are bringing into the relationship. How can we help them identify the emotion? How can we help them move through it safely that is, how can we help them self-regulate when an intense emotion appears in the conversation, which wouldn't be as strange? And how can we transform or alchemize that emotion to bring the gold? And finally, the last um, element in, to take into account into the, to bring into the relationship is em empathy. So empathy is an overarching element in a, in a high quality relationship with our clients. The pillars of empathy are self-awareness, peer awareness and action taking. So self-awareness, we have already talked about bringing self-awareness to ourselves, right? <laughs> but here I want to add that, um, I want to add that as coaches, we must guide our client to bring awareness to themselves. And we do that through questioning, right? For example, if a learner, learner complains about initiating a conversation in their target language, for example, let's say Spanish, and being replied to their native language, for example, in English, when they are in a Spanish-speaking country. So they are complaining about that. We need to guide them um, to explore why they are annoyed, or first of all, what what the emotion is. So they may be annoyed, they may be upset or frustrated. Why are they frustrated? How they feel when they when that occurs? What needs are not met when that happens, and why they think the other person behaved in that way. 
So in a way, we need to help them understand the situation from a different perspective, which leads me to the second pillar of empathy, which is peer awareness. Guiding your learner to, to see other perspectives is key. Guiding the learner to see from the perspective of the other with which they interact, be it the language, perspective, having a perspective on the culture, mindset, individuals, or another individual is one of the pillars of empathy. One, one way um, may be to introduce questioning. Why do you think this person reacted like that when you spoke, spoke like this? Why are they switching to your native language or to a common language? Why do you think they say these in this way? Or why do you think they do things in that way? Teaching languages um, is an opportunity to flex the empathic uh, muscle by bringing an awareness of other ways of being, thinking and doing. And we are aware of this as language and uh, language teachers and coaches. The practice of a non-native language is an opportunity to encounter situations that can either reinforce stereotypical beliefs and separation or create deeper understanding and connection with others. But because every one of us grew up in a certain environment with a certain culture and beliefs, our brains have integrated that our way is the right way or the normal way. So when confronted with other ways, um, they will unconsciously go straight into judging the other's behavior as wrong or upsetting and will make us uncomfortable or upset or tense or unsafe or, 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 you know. It's our job as coaches to help the learners see how they may be reading a situation, a behavior, a reaction in a way that is not helpful or it is plain harmful. And so the final pillar of empathy is practice or taking action. So once the exploration happens, it is time to put the insights into practice, um, which is easier said or thought than done. The learner came with an unconscious bias that is not, now not unconscious anymore, but what can we do now? So through conversation and awareness of the learner's mental process, coaching practices, there is questions and challenges, there is little pushes to the edge of their comfort zones. We can guide the learner to take action. I find that asking the learner what they can do differently in any given situation is a good starting point or about what behavior would be more positive, loving or conducive to achieving their needs. So all this to say that it's important to shift from bringing the focus to the language and the learner to starting with bringing the focus to ourselves first in order to understand what is it that we are bringing to the relationship. In fact, as we change and grow, our relationship with our clients changes as well. It changes with us and it changes with them. So it is useful to keep asking ourselves these questions of who am I? Who am I today? Who am I now? How am I feeling now? How am I feeling about my work now? How am I feeling about the work I am about to do? And from this awareness, we need to act accordingly, which means being compassionate with ourselves and also being vulnerable and sharing where we are at, how we are in the moment as we start the interaction with our client. So this is all from me. Um, that, that was the end of my talk. I think I may talk too fast. <laughs> so if there are any questions, I'm taking questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. First of all, thank you very, very much. It was kind of like a speed course <laughs> on, on the topic of, of uh, relating to ourselves to our clients, to the coaching process itself, and to the subject matter, which usually, I guess, for most of us is language, but maybe not not only. Um, 
I think there are a lot of takeaways for everyone. There, there are one or two responses here, but basically silence. And I, I know simply because you weren't going the usual route, you know, of, okay, here's my PPT and you can just screenshot or whatever, but you were actually, you know, talking about everyone was busy taking notes. So while everyone is trying to sift through all the, you know, golden nuggets that we've uh, received today, uh, I am going to very tentatively ask if anyone has questions, maybe not questions, but I'd say maybe um, our own observations or what we notice in our own coaching practices, the, the sessions that we've held. And uh, if anyone would like to unmute, we'd be very happy <laughs> with that and just share story. That's also fine. So I know that it, it brought up a, a lot of um, um, sessions that I've held lately. And not all of them are happy memories necessarily. So I think the one that strikes the nerve is like, how are you feeling towards your client? I've got one or two clients. I'm, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, and you, it's important to address that and to understand where that is coming from. What the re is it a personal issue? Is it a professional issue? Is it the topic itself that the client brings in? Is it some kind of behavior they have? So there's a lot of, perspectives that we need to be looking at um and i'm just trying to fill in the time <laughs> but uh th there was one thing here that came up that observation is key so if we don't observe ourselves and everything else i guess that that's one of the key moments in the key skills in coaching actually to be sensitive to to notice things and i really like that idea of you know being a mirror instead of allowing it to move into us and affect us emotionally wh whatever it is yeah mm -hmm. okay now mm -hmm. i don't see mm -hmm. here but is there anyone who'd like to unmute and i'm just going to change the view here so that i can see everybody but is there anyone who just so, like to comment or share something maybe? yeah maria yes okay yes so first thanks so much for this conversation and while I was listening to Maria, uh, we all are in the same way. We we can see ourselves clearly identified by all the things that she said, but uh, the mirror thing and, and telling us to, to see how we are ourselves before we enter into the, those conversations, those coaching sessions is essential because we're always looking at the other how the client is going to come in, how the client is going to feel. We know them, but sometimes we don't analyze ourselves and our emotions are super important in the moment we enter into these conversations. Yeah. And uh, my, my takeaway is this, uh, to reflect more on how we feel, yes, because of the effect that we have on, on them as well, right? And um, well, that's my my contribution here. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I th I think it's the this issue of reacting, responding, or reflecting, and sometimes it's a combination. Sometimes we we move in one direction, sometimes in the other, and it's very important to kind of monitor that triangle if you will of of these three r's you know and to understand where these are stemming from i'm, I'm going to take a note of this one. i think this is quite good <laughs> so uh understanding um our, our relationship which is the fourth r to to these and uh helping us be more sensitive and uh, creating more depth to the relationship to the work that we do and to have better outcomes yeah is there anyone else who'd like to come in? Yes, thank you. Hi. Well, this is a story that goes back a couple of decades, actually. I was in a class um, and a colleague of mine was in the same class. And there was a real conflict between me and the instructor. And my friend who is very bold about addressing these issues. And I learned that's a learning from me too. Um, she just she just stopped and she said, what's going on? 
-hmm. And the instructor that stopped him and he thought about it and he realized that I I reminded him of a cousin he does not like. (laughs) So when I have those situations of either someone that I'm feeling they don't like me, I do get curious about, well, maybe I remind them of somebody, or if I have the same reaction, a negative reaction or a positive one towards somebody, I stop myself and especially with the negative, who am I projecting onto this person? Mm. And that happened a couple decades ago. And I have to say that is still with me till today. And it serves me pretty well. So mm-hmm. that is my contribution. Excellent. Thank you. And I, I think it's a kind of story, you know, an anecdote that stays with you after all this time, right? And it's just, a, I don't know, a reminder, a wake up call, I think a combination of the two of, of the power of not forgetting that there are so many dimensions to any gut reaction that someone might have, you know, to you. And as coaches, we are responsible for not gut reacting, but to really learn to respond and work with all the emotions that are there for us and there for our coach, coaches, also our clients. Um, any any other stories, anything that you that this talk has reminded you to do more of, less of, or do something in a different way, perhaps? I know Marie is laughing. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I know. Yes, Jujo. Yep. Do unmute. Yes. Thank uh, hi, Maria. I would like to thank you very much for this talk, because uh, basically it just confirms the idea how, how very important the emotional connection is to our clients, because really this is the the um, glue or the the I don't know the material that connects us and uh, via this emotion, whatever that emotion is, uh, hopefully it's positive, but um, via this emotion, uh, can we together achieve a positive outcome and can we make this whole experience experience an enjoyable one? And by going through all the different types of emotions we might feel and also the various perspectives that we can put ourselves into when you mentioned the xenophobic class for example, I think it's wonderful to just think about it and think of our own experiences when we felt uncomfortable for one reason or another. And basically, uh, yes, it is a kind of an evolution. I mean, the more we grow as human beings and the more we can register uh, various kinds of feelings and emotions on our clients and even be aware of something um, disturbing that they might feel. And this previous example is excellent that quite often we trigger something in the client and then it sort of stays with us because we don't really know what it was. We maybe did everything we could. We wanted to have a really good session and then we trigger something and we don't even know what it might be therefore we might not be able to immediately react to it so for sure i think this emotional aspect and um being aware of ourselves of our uh, current state and general state i think it is very important and also keeping an eye on our uh, client and making sure that we have um kind of um human experience together and we put aside certain judgment for sure because that is the only way uh, we can work together and and still maintain the positive uh, aspect. So thank you for that. It really sort of inspired me in many different ways. Excellent, wonderful. Maria, look look what you've accomplished, fantastic. I'm happy, I'm happy. <laughs> good, good, good. That That's a good good emotion or a good feeling to register. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jojo, for sharing that and everyone for sharing um, your ideas and uh, okay. Um, chat boxes uh if anyone would like to just share what your takeaways are anything maybe it's just a word like reflection or registering emotions or anything we're very curious that uh, as coaches but as coach trainers also we're very curious to, to find out if there's anything that you're leaving with today okay so accountability mm, okay we've got one here any any other ideas that are coming up here 
for anyone. I know for me, it's this initial check-in, which we tend to forget. So we kind of prepare our notes or what, whatever we might be doing before sending out a quick email to somebody and then jumping onto the call, um, working online. Yeah, registering emotions, mirroring, absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there's, I think, a, a lot of depth to something that we don't necessarily pay that much attention to, but we should be. Okay. A book, thank you. Okay. Inspired and the awareness of how much I still need to learn. Okay. And thank you, Maria. Okay. Exploring our perception of the learner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And how they perceive us. And then so there it goes there and back. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So I think there are a lot of takeaways, a lot of ideas that are cropping up for everyone. And uh, thank you very much for joining us wherever you're joining from. It might be morning or late in the evening. And hopefully we'll be meeting in person next year in Budapest. So keep your eyes peeled. We're going to be sharing it on social media everywhere. And thank you very much. And you can watch the recording. We'll be on our YouTube channel. So um, check that out. We sent the uh, the link earlier. So thank you very much. And thank you, Maria. Any any closing thoughts based on, you know, all that has happened to you? Well, no, I am. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share. That's always um great and also thank you all for listening and I feel that I was speaking super fast so my emotions were I was nervous <laughs> I, I was nervous um so that was with me in the real I brought that to the relationship and so um needs to be acknowledged but thank you for the opportunity thank you very much I don't think we noticed any any kind of uh, n nervousness. I think it was more excitement, you know, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Hope to see you in our future events. And, uh, okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.